Thanks, um, and thanks for the introduction, uh, Marika. So in today's presentation, I'll be introducing and illustrating a set of consistent methods the net benefit correspondence theorem provides for undertaking robust, well flexible evaluation in many technology assessment, policy and practice settings, and in particular in settings where comparison consistent with maximizing net benefit uh, has advantages. And particularly, I'll be looking at multiple strategy and multiple domain comparisons, and that's to really inform uh, relevant big data analysis in policy and practice settings. So in overview and doing that, um, I'm gonna focus on the advantages of the net benefit correspondence theorem in uh, three principal areas, and then a kind of overview at the end of how that extends to uh, joint research reimbursement regulatory decisions. And that those areas are really in health technology assessment with multiple strategies, in comparing efficiency of policies or providers in practice, consistent with maximizing net benefit, and in multiple domain of effect comparisons for cost effectiveness or net benefit comparisons. In general, the net benefit methods enable uh, flexible and robust evaluation, and in many settings where you need them, where you have real world complex settings, um, and those, examples of those, could, you could think of things like diagnostic and genetic testing, uh, and multiple mo modality settings where you need to look at, at uh, multiple strategies in comparison. Um, and also in many settings where you have um, health promotion evaluation. So there's things like the Child with Integrated Movement Guidelines, which combine sleep, sedentary behavior, physical activity. Whenever you're looking at things like age and dementia friendly environments, you're always wanting to look at multiple strategies, but absolutely also multiple domains. And in palliative settings where you always have multiple domains beyond survival and things which can't be integrated with survival, such as finalizing affairs, being the place that they want to be to die and being with the community they want to be with. So in doing so, I'm really also introducing you the, to the health economics from theory to practice text and course. And the chapters we'll be focusing on are the ones right in the middle on the evidence synthesis and translation and for multiple strategy, multiple uh, domain comparisons, which are chapters eight to 10. We'll also in the process uh, be touching on value information methods because the summary method uh, measures that we get expected net loss curves and frontiers uh, really uh, also inform value information analysis. They uh, represent expected value of perfect information and enable you then to move on to optimizing research designs and looking at optimal research and reimbursement decisions. And down the bottom there, we're also going to be looking at comparisons in practice and hence the evaluation when you're regulating uh, to create incentives consistent with maximizing that benefit in practice. But to start with, we'll start with the kind of underlying tenants, underlying health economic or cost effectiveness analysis, which are decision analytic principles or decision analytic um, analysis principles as well. Um, and really they're about joint principles of coverage and comparability. Uh, the coverage um, is, the, is the extra thing that pe people <clears throat> tend to think they know what comparability is about, and that's getting kind of relative treatment effects, which are meaningful. Um, and a relative to appropriate comparator or comparators. And then the coverage really though is about having significant length of follow-up and scope and duration, the effects and resource use and costs that you cover. And both those things are important to get right when you're doing any kind of health economic analysis before you start modeling any uncertainty or representing uncertainty uh, in, because in a decision framework, you really wanna have unbiased estimates before you start having estimation of what the uncertainty is around it. It's a bit pointless having um, uncertainty est estimating around biased estimates when you're looking at decisions around net benefit or net clinical benefit. So here's the typical depiction um, which I developed with John Symes and um, which the PBAC uses for how we're uh, representing decision-making in a jurisdiction of interest such as Australia, but very much used in every jurisdiction uh, internationally. And you've got a relative treatment effect, which is being modified. Uh, you're modifying a, a baseline risk to get some estimate of absolute effect difference. Um, and we do that for both the effects and then maybe multiple effects, um, and typically some primary effects, secondary effects, side effects, et cetera, um, but also for resource use and cost. And the effects we trade off to get to notions of net clinical benefit, 
And then that is extended to notions of net benefit by also allowing for the resource use and cost. So net clinical benefit is the change in effect. Note it's an absolute effectiveness, not efficacy, so it's not the relative effect. And it trades off the harms and benefits in the population of interest for the jurisdiction of interest. And typically when we're doing analysis in Australia, that's Australia, but wherever your jurisdiction of interest is, whether that's the UK, Canada, et cetera. And to do that, as we've indicated, you modify baseline risk by the relative treatment effect. The best evidence, the relative treatment effect is from randomized control trial setting or whatever setting you can get the best relative treatment effect estimate from, which in health technology assessment is going to be RCTs, but in many health promotion evaluations, et cetera, may be uh, other forms of controlled analysis. But the best evidence of baseline risk are going to be from epidemiological data in the case of health um, in Australia, if we're looking at the Australian jurisdiction, but whatever jurisdiction you're interested in. So just to confirm what net benefit is, uh, net benefit is a way of representing um, the net clinical benefit and the resource use and cost together. It really uh, comes from a re-expression of the incremental cost effectiveness ratio as some threshold and basically saying, well, if you're below some threshold lambda, then the incremental benefit is that threshold value times by your incremental effects less your incremental costs, where that value is the value of incremental effect. Um, and that incremental benefit statistic importantly has good statistical properties, whereas the incremental cost effectiveness ratio doesn't. You typically represent it on the incremental cost effectiveness plane. And when we do that, we say that if the new treatment is more costly and less effective, then the existing treatment dominates. If the new treatment is uh, less costly and more effective, the new treatment dominates. But more generally, we've got trade-offs between costs and effects. And if the new treatment is more effective, but more costly or less effective, but also less costly. And when that's the case, we apply the threshold value and the slope of that line gives you your lambda, uh, or whatever your lambda is, defines the slope of that line. And below that line, uh, we say something's cost effective above that line or to the Northwest, we say it's not cost effective. And that's in deterministic analysis. And obviously we can draw distributions or clouds around whatever point estimates we have for doing things under uncertainty. So as I've alluded to, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is what had been traditionally used, doesn't have good properties. So if I go from something which is, has a slightly positive effect to a slightly negative effect, and it has the same cost, it goes from basically positive infinity to minus infinity. It's the ultimate discontinuity. Um, in the north, west, and south east quadrant, they both have negative ices. You've got um, a negative ISA where you have uh, negative effect and positive cost or negative cost and positive effect, uh, but they clearly have very different implications in one it's dominating and one it's dominated. Um, and then finally, along any ray through the origin, uh, C there, with C representing the comparator, uh, in those northwest and southeast quadrants, that's going to have the same um, uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio, but of course it's becoming more and more uh, dominated when you're heading further into northwest quadrant and, and dominates more as you go into the southeast quadrant. Okay, so basically the ISA doesn't have good um, ordering and doesn't have uh, the, the properties that you need for it to be a good statistic. Whereas the incremental net benefit does have um, good properties, it's well ordered, it's continuous when the change in effect sign changes from slightly positive to slightly negative, it just has a blip in terms of the incremental net benefit. Well, not, no blip, but it's continuous, but it, you get a small change in the incremental net benefit. Um, it's appropriately positive in the uh, southeast quadrant when you dominate. It's going to be negative in the northwest quadrant when you, when you uh, dominate it. Um, and that's appropriate. And more generally, um, as you move along lines in, in those quadrants, it's going to get slightly more uh, positive or slightly more negative, depending on whether it's the uh, northwest or southeast quadrant. Okay, so that's what we do when we've got two strategies. But um, in general, we've, we've got a problem in that the other thing which is important to note here is that performance improves when you move in a southeast direction, but that doesn't contract to any vertex or anything. You're just moving in a southeast direction. And so we've got unbounded analysis, unbounded comparison, et cetera. And indeed, as we'll see, it stops you from using all sorts of nice methods you might want to use 
whether data development analysis, index methods, or even things like stochastic frontier if you wanted to use it radially. So um, to do some analysis which enables you to do that, um, I developed the net benefit correspondence theorem. And it shows there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between maximizing net benefit and minimizing net loss. And net loss here is also sometimes called quality inclusive cost. And it's basically the value of effects framed from a disutility bearing perspective plus costs. And that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with maximizing net benefit where two conditions are met, where the effects framed from disutility bearing perspective cover the same effects of care that we have with E in, in the expression for net benefit. And when the differences in expected costs and effects are adjusted for when we've basically standardized and we've, that's called the common comparator condition. So there's a very easy proof and it's, um, and it's basically just establishing an ordering and showing that it remains the same um, when you reframe net benefit in terms of in, uh, uh, quality inclusive cost. I won't bother going through it because it's in all the papers, but um, it, it, it means it, they're, they're, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. You get double arrows going both ways. So we've got a correspondence. And indeed, it applies in multiple domains, multiple dimensions. So this is the simplest form of it, but there's many different proofs of it. Okay, and that's important when we particularly come to compare multiple strategies. And as I've alluded to, multiple strategies are key in many, many areas, um, and particularly in genetic testing, in anything to do with, with screening, um, when you've got multiple modalities trying to compare, but actually when you're looking at multiple strategies, when you're looking at uh, health promotion options and policies, et cetera, you're always gonna be looking at multiple um, comparisons. And that's key because the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, uh, sorry, or the incremental cost effectiveness plane and incremental benefit are always relative to a comparator. They're not relative to, um, uh, when, when you have multiple strategies, what is the comparator? Well, it should really change depending on what the evidence is in any given replicate, but also depending on what your threshold value is. So comparison can be between a strategy and a single comparator or bilateral, which is typically what health economics initially looked at, or between multiple strategies and multilateral. And that's increasingly important for multiple strategy, diagnostic, genetic, multiple modality, alternative treatment pathways, and all the seeing of policy options, and often in health promotion and prevention, et cetera. So let's have a look at an example of one of those multiple strategy comparisons. And this one's taken from a study well-known study by Briggs, Gorey, Blackhouse and O'Brien for gastroesophageal reflux disease with six strategies. And you've got this cost per patient over a year of the six strategies there. And the weeks with GERD or GERD, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, but it's gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it, of course, that's a bad thing. So you, you wanna minimize the weeks with GERD, you wanna minimize cost. This is in cost this utility uh, space already. So in comparing more than or multiple strategies, um, the appropriate comparator for any given strategy in whether it's maximizing effect, minimizing costs or maximizing net benefit is change, gonna change across replicates and in the case of net benefit with the threshold values effect. So it's not fixed. When you do things on the cost effectiveness plane, because that is fixed, um, they have a arbitrary rule of basically setting the least cost strategy to being the, uh, the origin and everything's compared relative to it. Um, and then you form a frontier um, of non-dominated strategies and anything to the um, Northwest is dominated. Anything on the frontier, you can't move further to the Southeast to some linear combination of other strategies. And strictly strategies like D here uh, what we call strictly dominated, and F is what's called extended dominated. It's dominated by a linear combination of E and B. Okay, but you can see here we haven't got a radial property. We're improving performance when we move in a southeast direction. We are not contracting to any kind of vertex here. We can't get any ratios which are meaningful, and we can't use things like data development analysis or index methods, etc., in trying to form that frontier or measure relative to that frontier how inefficient D and F are, for example. So as I've said, with the net benefit correspondence theorem, we've got a nice linear transformation, which allows us to now look at the, exactly the same strategies on the cost disutility plane. And you can see you've still got the same strategies on the frontier, but we can now measure the extent to which D or F are in, inefficient or, um, or have reductions in net benefit relative to the other strategies. And indeed any threshold value, we can identify the optimal strategy. Those are ISO net benefit or ISO 
um, net loss lines there and moving towards the origin is of course improving because you're reducing disutility here, number of weeks with GERD and we're reducing costs. The other thing I should really highlight in this diagram is we've got flexible axes here. So we're always measuring effect in terms of disutility relative to the most effective strategy or the lowest disutility strategy, um, which in this example is B. So it's got zero disutility relative to itself. It's the, the, the um, highest effect strategy. And the lowest cost strategy we're measuring cost relative to, which in this case is, is C. And that's nice because it gives us a nice bounded space. And it means when we come in a minute to look at uncertainty, we can get full inference, et cetera, in this space as well. So there's a series of advantages of thing, looking at efficiency frontiers on the cost disutility plane. Um, they allow equivalent identification of dominance and net benefit maximization, but we also get technically simple construction efficiency frontiers. We can now use uh, data development analysis, um, index methods, stochastic frontier with radial properties. To, uh, to perform those frontiers and measure the efficiency relative to those frontiers. So the degree of dominance or relative efficiency can be estimated. And we've got a bounded comparison of net benefit from those flexible axes. But we also, that's deterministically some advantages. When we look at uncertainty, we also get another series of advantages. So here is um, uncertainty around those six strategies. Um, on the incremental cost effectiveness plane. Note that strategy C, because it's the least cost strategy and you're always comparing relative to it, is still just going to be at the one spot, but the other five strategies are going to have distributions. Now, within this space, we can say absolutely nothing about uh, inference on effects. And that's because the purple, light blue, and yellow strategies, and maybe even the dark blue strategies, all overlap in terms of their effect. Um, and that's because they're all being measured relative to the lowest cost strategy rather than necessarily the, the, um, the highest effect strategy as they would be with flexible axes. And we'll see in a minute on the cost disutility plane. Okay, so we can't say anything about uh, in inference for, for effects. In terms of costs, all we can really say is that strategy A, when it is below zero is the least cost strategy. And when it's not, it's strategy C, um, and it might be 40% of the cases that strategy um, uh, a is the least cost and, a, and the residual 60% of strategy C, but you don't actually get to see that distribution because it's just a dot because everything's relative to it. Okay, so, so why does the cost effectiveness plan not allow inference with multiple strategies? Um, it's because the cost effectiveness plane could be the, any of the strategies, B, F, or E could be the highest effect strategy in the replicate given that its distributions overlap. So the inference is confound on the cost effectiveness plane. Um, and that's because you've got fixed axes and you're always measuring relative A comparator rather than the best comparator in terms of effects or costs, or as we'll see in a minute, net benefit when it comes to net benefit. If we put things on the cost disutility plane and do measure things relative to, oh, can you still hear me? Yes, please hear you. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> um, so here, when we put it on the cost disutility plane, we now get full inference. And what was hidden in that last, uh, or the diagram, two, two diagrams before, is now revealed. Strategy B is, in fact, in every single replicate, the lowest disutility or highest effect strategy, lowest number of weeks with GERD, um, highest number of weeks without GERD strategy. So that was completely hidden. On the, on the cost effectiveness plane here, on the cost disutility plane with flexible axes, it's revealed the whole distribution lies on the, on the axis. It, it always has zero disutility. It's always the most effective. And similarly, we can now see that 40% of the time that, uh, that strategy uh, A is the best or lowest cost strategy and 60% of the time strategy C because you've got distributions for both of them. Okay, so B is always the most effective. It's, it's the entire distribution on the vertical axis um, and A or C the least costly. So hence the cost issue plane enables full inference in relation effects and costs graphically um, and from the proportion of distributions on the vertical and horical horizontal axis axes respectively. However, what's the key thing? The key thing for a health economist is around joint costs and effects and net benefit, and that's still hidden. So we need further analysis to inform societal decision-making around cost effectiveness. Now, in doing that, it's important to note that, in fact, the literature talks about, um, in general, 
under the arrow limb theorem, societal decision making approaching risk neutrality um, with risk spreading or diversification across many decisions in large government. Okay, and that was certainly also argued by Claxton in his relevance of inference paper. Um, in reality, there is going to be some um, risk aversion, and that's because patient outcomes are not diversifiable, and because there's potential effects on private markets, as argued by Graf Zivin and Bridges in 2002. But in general, we can characterize societal decision makers at either risk neutral or somewhat risk averse, you know, risk neutral in, in asymptotically risk neutral, if you like. So if we're risk neutral, we'd only be interested in maximizing expected net benefit. If we're somewhat risk averse, we're going to trade off where there are trade offs, expected values against probabilities. So if your expected net benefits higher, but your probabilities lower, there's going to be a trade off. Okay, Fenwick in 2001 recognized the need to compare expected net benefit, not just to look at probabilities, um, and proposed a thing called the cost effective acceptability frontier. I'm not going to show you that because it has a series of problems, and the series of problems are kind of described briefly below. What essentially cost effective frontier does is it prevent, presents you with probabilities as indicators of where things maximize expected net benefit. Um, but it's a black box in terms of explaining why it maximizes expected net benefit. Um, and more, and perhaps just as importantly, the probabilities that you're presented with are from the probability of maximizing net benefit across all strategies rather than necessarily the comparisons that you want to look at, which are normally between two strategies at any given threshold value. And in general, it, it points to the need for better and clearer explanations and informing of decision-making by societal decision-makers. So towards that end, and this is very much also um, extending the stuff in terms of flexible axes on the cost disutility plane, what we actually want to compare when we compare net benefit or the combined costs and effects is things relative to the net benefit maximizing strategy at any given threshold value for any given replica. Um, and to do that, I developed something called the net loss statistic. And the net loss for any given strategy is just the net loss relative to the net benefit maximizing strategy. So it's the net benefit of the maximizing strategy less that of any given strategy. If you happen to be the net benefit maximizing strategy, that's net loss is going to be zero. Otherwise, it's going to be some positive uh, number. And importantly, that statistic is flexible that appropriately varies with the threshold value and across replicates while it's being consistent across the strategy. So we get coverage and comparability. And most importantly, the comparability is, is um, robust here. They're no more difficult also to construct than cost effectiveness acceptability curves, because in both cases, you need to identify the strategy maximizing that benefit and then give a replicate. Um, and then for the expected net loss curves, you nearly calculate for each, each strategy its expected net loss, in other words, the loss across uh, the thousand or how many replicates you've got relative to that net benefit maximizing strategy. For the cost effectiveness acceptability curves, it was simply the proportion of times that you maximize net benefit. Okay, and here is the expected net loss curves and frontier. And this is a quite beautiful diagram because it now shows us across those six strategies, the strategy which minimizes net loss is equivalent to maximizing net benefit. We know that from correspondence theorem. And so you've got C from zero up to $10.26, A from $10.26 to $35.02, E from $35.02 up to $265.79 and B beyond that. Okay, and those strategies minimize expected net loss, equivalently maximize net benefit and any given threshold value. And that's very nice, but it, it's also because it explains why, because they have lower net loss than all the other strategies at those threshold values. C has lower loss than A, E, D, or F up to $10.26, similarly A uh, from $10.26 to $35 to, et cetera. And finally, which I'll, I'll kind of uh, read, reinforce a minute in a couple of slides, it also gives you the expected value of perfect information. So that's, that's what you want to know, given current information, which are the strategies which minimize expected net loss, maximize net benefit, any given threshold value. But it actually also, the actual height of those, that frontier at the bottom, the bottom line with C, A, E, and B at the bottom, actually gives you the expected value of perfect information. So if we had perfect information, there'd be a proportion of, strategy, uh, of replicates in which A would have been higher from zero to $10.26, et cetera. The actual distance that is represented by the, the frontier there is the actual expected value of perfect information. It's the expected loss that could have been avoided 
if we had absolutely perfect information. So it's also informing, as we'll allude to in a minute, and I'll uh, reinforce the, the decision about, do I need further research? Okay, and here, if I had something around $100 to $200 per week of GERD avoided, uh, it's basically saying, no, we've got enough evidence, ease the optimal strategy. If I'm around $10 or $35, $265, then sure, I may need another trial of A versus C at $10, um, A versus E at $35, or um, around $265 E versus B. Okay, so it, 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 it's giving you multiple evidence to inform the side of decision maker about what's optimal given current evidence, but actually also the potential value of undertaking further research and directing you towards what that research might be. Okay, coming back to uh, risk neutral or somewhat risk averse decision maker. If you're risk neutral, you're only interested in expecting that benefit. It's giving you everything you need to know about that across the six strategies and informing you which one minimizes expected net loss, couldn't we maximize expected net benefit? So it directly informs your optimal strategy. If you're somewhat risk averse, then you're going to support that strategy, that same strategy, where they also have the highest probability of maximizing that benefit. But otherwise, you might want to trade off in regions like. $10, 26, $35, 02, or 265, 79, if there were probabilities which were higher, for instance, um, for, uh, for A rather than C at, at, at some point just below $10, 26, or equivalently for C versus A above that, et cetera, you might want to look at trade offs at those points. But actually, only between those two strategies, not between all the strategies. Um, and you're going to get confounding if you allow other strategies, such as over here, strategy F, to influence the relationship between E and B in terms of the probabilities. So to prevent confounding, um, we are gonna look at discrete regions between potential optimal strategies of interest. Um, and the CEA curves, that was one of the problems with them. They, they're always gonna give you the, the probability across all strategies rather than the strategies of interest. But anyway, if you, if you are potentially risk averse, you can look at bilateral comparisons, for instance, between E and B around $269. And it turns out it's a very small area, about a dollar per uh, week of GERD avoided from 268 something to 269 something where you're gonna get a potential trade-off. If we looked at the CEA curves, that region, because we had confounding the strategy F was about $7. Um, but this is, this is the true uh, region where you, you're, you're potentially gonna get uh, a trade-off occurring. And using that, we can then say definitively, these are the regions where we, um, if we're somewhat risk averse, have uh, certainty about strategy C, um, strategy A and strategy E, and then there's the small trade-off regions, um, which some people say, or I, I've argued, I suppose also, could also be an artifact of the method you're using, as opposed to necessarily being real regions of trade-offs. But, um, and under, the Aralim theorem asymptotically, um, you're going to probably value more the expected net benefit than you will the probability anyway for most of that region. So they become even smaller than they look here. Okay, now as I've alluded to, we also get in this one figure not just what is the optimal strategy across the six strategies in this case, or multiple n, n number of strategies, but you also get the expected value perfect information across those n strategies and any th threshold value. Um, so it's simultaneously expected net loss frontier, which is that bottom curve there, identifies the strategy maximizing net benefit, or expected net benefit, and the expected value of perfect information at any threshold value. Okay, so when it comes to uh, societal decision making around health technology assessment, it's saying if you've got multiple strategies, we should be putting things on the cost disutility plane rather than the cost effectiveness plane, looking at expected net loss curves and frontiers that you've just seen. Um, and if you're somewhat risk averse, you might want to have bilateral trade-offs in regions where they occur between maximizing expected net benefit, which is what you get from the expected net loss curves, and bilateral um, uh, CEA curves between the strategy of interest at the threshold values of interest. Okay, in reality, even when doing two strategies, we should also look at expected net loss curves and frontiers because they also give us the expected value perfect information, which we don't get um, from looking at things on the incremental cost of thickness plane or looking at distributions on those, in those spaces. Okay. So in conclusion, in terms of comparing multiple strategies or multiple <coughs> uh, under uncertainty, and well, deterministically under uncertainty, I'm gonna do the multiple domains in a minute. I've done a bit of reordering here. The cost issue plan always allows effective cost inference, unlike the cost effectiveness plane. 
And the things in brackets are for when we look at multiple domains. So we're still going to look at things in the causticity plane or causticity space, actually, when we come to multiple domains. And we're going to have radar pots when we've got many dimensions to represent things for societal decision makers. Secondly, the risk and use of decision makers directly informed by expecting that loss curves and frontier, unlike the cost effectiveness acceptability curves and frontier. Okay, and it's not a black box, it's telling you everything I need to know why, as well as at which threshold values, et cetera. Um, if you're somewhat risk averse, then we have potentially have these trade off regions, um, and they should be bilateral CA curves to prevent confounding, not the multilateral CA curves, which had me proposed by Fenwick. And finally, the expected net loss frontier or the expected net loss surface when we look at multiple uh, domains in a minute also represents the expected value of perfect information with current uncertainty at any given threshold value. And that gives you an explicit link between research and reimbursement decisions. So in terms of linking research, reimbursement practice and, and indeed also pricing, comparison or loss in net benefit on the cost issue plane provides a rough framework that leads to or as we've seen, best multiple strategy, and we'll see in a minute multiple effect comparisons and summary measures. Um, it also allows us to look at joint optimal research and reimbursement decisions using value information methods because it represents EVPI, which is the start of the process towards using value information. Um, in a minute, we're also going to show you it allows you to get performance or efficiency measurement and funding consistent with maximizing that benefit in practice, which is a big advantage, which now the methods allow you to do. Um, and finally, it also allows you to actually look at meaningful threshold values for maximizing net benefit in decision making across many uh, investments or decisions. And that's because we're always comparing with the most cost effective comparator, which is what you should be doing. And that supports something called the uh, health shadow price that uh, Rita Pekarsky developed. Okay, and in general, it aligns incentives across research reimbursement practice and pricing, and it's a consistent method across all, all of those things. So here's what we get when we apply it in efficiency measurement in, in practice. Um, and this is you know, getting closer to what often we'll do with big data. So here uh, I'm looking at 45 New South Wales hospitals um, for a particular DRG for respiratory infection, and I've got their cost per admission and their mortality rate. Putting it in the cost disutility plane, I can get all sorts of lovely efficiency measures, and I can get uh, relative efficiency measures, technical scale, economic efficiency measures, I can get health shadow prices, et cetera, because I've got this nice radial property. And we're doing exactly what we were doing before. We're trying to radially contract towards the vertex, trying to minimize costs, minimize mortality rate, or just utility more generally. And because it's radial, of course, we can add as many dimensions as we'd like as well. We're still going to be radially contracting towards that vertex. And here's just some numbers to show you how some of the technical efficiency and variable returns to scale efficiency play out in that setting, net benefit efficiency, and importantly, uh, that's creating the appropriate incentives for maximizing net benefit, um, how we can get peer benchmarking um, and, and the threshold values at which that occurs. And then probably the most important thing for societal decision makers, if you're looking at one number, is the shadow price. What is the current implicit value being placed on, in this case, avoiding mortality in the setting? And we can estimate that as where, uh, <clears throat> allocative efficiency um, is, is maximized. And that in this case was $3,500 per additional survivor. So if you specify quality and really we're specifying quality um, as a from a disutility bearing perspective as an input with the um, net benefit correspondence theorem alongside costs and try and minimize quality inclusive costs, that allows you to have an intuitive story, economic, technical, allocate scale efficiency, we can identify efficient peers, we get shadow price of effects. And most importantly, and this is what I'm now going to highlight because this is most important for big data, we also get a robust framework for preventing cost shifting and cream skimming incentives. So in reality, to satisfy those comparability and coverage conditions we have with the net benefit correspondence conditions, we need to be adjusting for things at point of, of um, presentation in, in hospital in this case. Uh, or in any care kind of setting. Um, and that's necessary and sufficient to prevent cream skimming incentives, uh, noting that you can only actually cream skim on observable patient population differences, but you need to be adjusting for all things you can observe. Strictly, you know, if we're doing something in HDA setting, we want to be adjusting for things you can't observe as well, but, uh, or try to, but in, in, in reality, cream skimming can actually only cream skim on things we can observe. So, in doing that, 
there's really a three-step process suggested to satisfy those correspondence um, conditions, prevent cream skimming and cost shifting incentives. So we need to identify patient outcomes for risk factors at point of admission. We need to measure costs and effects, including those beyond discharge if we can. And in reality, that means you either have to have data linkage or you model the effects uh, given discharge state something conditional at discharge state that you, you're measuring. And then you're gonna be adjusting the outcome rates and costs for patient population differences at admission. In really, that means we're trying, trying to standardize, we're trying to standardize when we're comparing. Um, here's an example from when I looked at three South Australian hospitals in terms of percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty and two particular DRGs, which define those in the hospital setting. Um, and we had data linkage, we had mortality and readmission of 12 months data from date of index admission. And then we standardized for age and Charleston comorbidity index. I think we also did for sex as well, which I probably forgot to add in there. Okay, so here is um, the, the numbers here. And importantly, in this example, we show uh, how to, how to standardize. And importantly, it's using odds ratios. So it's a binary effect. Um, and we, we want to be using odds ratios to, to um, to standardize the mortality, so either you either die or survive. We want to use odds ratios because if you use it relative risk or anything else, it's, uh, it, it's not consistent. If you reframe it as survival mortality, different results. If you use odds ratios, it's consistent. And that's what I showed in Eckham and Crawley and Willem 2009, 2011, and then most recently um, in comparisons of efficiency in practice in Eckham and Willem, Oakley, Tremblay and Coeli 2021. Um, Anyway, I'm putting that in because these are the kind of methods that you'd need to do to do it robustly and have consistent estimates and, and, and do it in, 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 you know, we can use all these nice flexible methods, but you want to make them robust. Okay, and those are the comparisons we get when we've got standardized across the three hospitals in that particular example. Okay. The next thing I just really wanted to go through is some multiple dimension stuff. And I'm very briefly going to skip over some of the framing for this, but this is the study which got the Vice Chancellor's Award last year for partnership and, um, and translation into practice. Um, and it's a November study, found, foundation study funded, and it's about a mental health intervention, 13 effects dimensions we've got, and five domains. That's the important thing mathematically we would be looking at. And there are the 13 effects on the right hand side and the five domains they represent on the left hand side. And you can see they've got different scores, which have different ranges, and so everything has to be standardized to be consistent, et cetera, and to allow comparisons and aggregation, et cetera. When we do that, and here they are on the cost utility plane, but here as a radar plot. So we've got all 13 dimensions, and we're still trying to minimize um, this utility here. So all the effects frame from this utility perspective is trying to minimize. Now it turns out the AOTG was best on every single one of the um, dimensions. And indeed that means domains as well. Um, so it's at the origin and the comparison with usual practice, and this is pre post adjusted analysis, but um, it's, uh, yeah, we've, 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 we've essentially got here uh, something we were trying to minimize cost uh, and disutility. And, um, and it turns out it's better on every single um, one of those things. Now to do things under uncertainty, we developed a nice bootstrapping method, which can allow for all sorts of missing data, et cetera. And doing that and standardizing the scores, we showed that 10 out of the 13 dimensions, if we had a 5% type one error, were statistically significant and three weren't. Um, and there's the standardized difference on the right and the raw scores on the left there, um, where we're adjusting for the score ranges, et cetera. Okay, now what this is pointing to is, okay, if, if we just have one of these effects, well, we've got 13 of them, but if we have one of them, there's a, you know, a lottery, basically 10 of those 13, it's gonna show us, if, we, if we'd chosen one of them, it would have been a 10 and 13 chance that uh, it, would have, it would have been effective with, with a 5% type one error, um, but three, it wouldn't have been. When we put them up to the domain level and then up to a global level, the first five there are domain level and global level, and here you notice know, the, the, the statistically significant denotion there is less than 1% with, with the one star, less than 0.1% with two stars, and less than 0.001% with three stars. 
they're all highly st statistically significant, each of the domains. And at, and at a global level, they're both highly statistically significant. And the global ones here are done two ways from dimension level up to a global level directly or uh, dimension to domain, then to the global level. Um, anyway, what it's showing you is looking at them together, we get a much better picture than we do if we just uh, were looking at one, one of them alone. Um, and, it, and it's highly statistically significant. Um, and that reflects the fact that all dimensions favoured AOTG. Importantly, what this is pointing to is the importance of looking at all this stuff together, the data together, rather than partialising it. So partial consideration of single effects would not have adequately covered effects and led to greater uncertainty in a lottery as to whether AOTG was considered effective or cost effective given the long term net cost implications. The triangulation is particularly key because we then showed it was highly effective, uh, regardless of whether you looked at a domain level or even greater, uh, highly statistically significant and significant at a, at a global level. Um, and then in terms of the interpretation overall, it, this was an intervention which only cost $37 per, pay, per participant. It was a health promotion intervention in, in um, school based, uh, sorry, in sports based settings for mental health. Um, and the long term uh, cost reductions you get from improving effects are likely to be much greater than that. So in reality, it's really pointing to this being a, a, a dominating strategy um, if we appropriately have coverage to allow for the long term uh, <clears throat> treatment effects and cost savings associated with the high levels effects on all dimensions. So in terms of the bottom line, in terms of key advantage of the method, expending the net benefit correspondence methods with cost disutility radar plots on flexible axes, jointly comparing standardized incremental effects, um, enables you to explicitly compare in combination all the things together and you overcome the perils of partialization. And as we've seen, that also can extend to, oh, here, yeah, I'm gonna go through, it's very fast, to things like, um, we can look at expected net loss curves and frontiers as as um, as as diagrams like this, which are kind of slightly funkier diagram. And where we've got two effects here. This is much harder to do with you know, more than two effects. Obviously, we can only look at three dimensions, um, but we can certainly go to the radar plots when we get more than three dimensions. Um, and here's the what we call those things when we get to multiple dimensions. So we've got threshold regions, combination of values over which the strategies maximise net benefit or equivalently minimise net loss there. And we get these uh, expected net loss, um, expect, expected net loss contours and, um, and, and inspected net loss space here um, rather than, um, yeah, when, when we've got multiple dimensions. Okay, and then finally, and this was for Thomas, who probably isn't there, but. Um, obviously, these methods are generalizable to any setting. So I've looked at some health applications, but in reality, you can use that in any setting. So here's what you might look at if you were looking at energy generation with a net benefit frontier and net maximizing provider, where we're trying to minimize cost and CO2 emissions and looking at which um, providers might, might be best. Okay, I'll quickly just go back to the references, which were there. And there's some series of references there. 